Welcome, welcome. My name is Jolene Mujica. I'm the head of trends and tours at Windowsware. The Windowsware team is here. Welcome to those of you who have been um, joining us every Tuesday for these sort of trend chats and on Thursdays for our industry speakers. Um, today we're going to take a look at museum exhibits. Um, if you have any questions along the way, by all means, I heavily encourage, feel free, chime in, unmute yourself. If you've been to these exhibits, if you've been to these museums, I want to hear your feedback. I want to hear your personal experiences. Um, this is interactive, so don't feel like, you know, I'm just sort of talking at you. Uh, I want to talk with you guys. So uh, feel free to also, if you have any questions, if you're feeling a little shy, I don't want to turn your camera or your mic on, totally awesome. Uh, just go ahead and put that in the chat feature. Raul and our team's going to be taking a look at that, and we'll be asking questions along the way. So, oh, perfect. We just populated another three or four people. So welcome. We're going to go ahead and get started. All right, let me go ahead and pop this bad boy open. All right, so here we go. Let me close this up so I don't get distracted. All right, so welcome. Um, again, my name is Jolene Mujica, and whether this is your first time here or you've been to several of these, it's always lovely to see you. Um, today, we're gonna be talking about the idea of fashion as art. Museum exhibitions uh, curated, whether through the brand or through uh, an actual museum. Um, if you've been to these exhibits, I just mentioned this, but I know we got a couple more people. Please chime in. Let us know your experience. I've been to a lot of these, but a lot of these I also have not been to or been to variations of the touring shows. So let's go ahead and get started. Whoops. Boop. Um, so we're going to start with curatorial museum exhibitions and the biggest question we're going to answer here is you know is fashion art right is it a form of art and obviously the short answer is yes i think everyone in this room and everyone listening would probably agree right and we've seen museums worldwide sort of answer this question from a standpoint of cultural relevance for decades right and fashion exhibitions are great because they can showcase designers and from a museological standpoint or perspective through the conservation of garments archives providing context into historical accuracy and inspiration right so these exhibits are unbelievable, right? Um, and I should also note that this is not where brands come for financial gain, right? Though the idea of like the practice of exiting through the gift shop, it's always implemented, right? It's that Disney World style, right? Go through the attraction, then exit through the gift shop. Of course, everyone wants some form of um, financial ROI, uh, but it can be very, it's not necessarily about that, but it can, however, be very lucrative for the museum and the museums and the institutions who attract millions of people every year through cultural tourism, right? And if we know uh, about tourism from our hospitality chat a couple weeks ago that there's two sectors, there's consumer tourism, so you're shopping, dining, hotels, and then your cultural tourism, which consists of things like landmarks, right? Going to see the Statue of Liberty, Big Ben, the Vatican, and at the epicenter of that are museums, right? You probably wouldn't go to Paris and see the Eiffel Tower without also going to the Louvre, right? So this is great because the fashion industry fits into both of those, right? Both consumer and cultural tourism, and museums are this vital role in the effort of like attracting that demographic. So let's jump right in. We're going to take a look at two separate kinds of exhibitions today. Um, uh, chronological surveys, which are timelines of a specific designer or a period of history, and then thematic surveys, right? Inspiration, which could be multiple collections curated around a specific theme. Let's jump on in. So I could have picked easily, you know, 10, 20 exhibits from the Met, uh, but this particular one is uh, pretty incredible because um, Heavenly Bodies and the uh, Fashion and the Catholic Imagination was the largest, most attended exhibit that the Met has ever organized, right? It brought in 1.7 million people. Um, it was absolutely incredible. Um, did anybody go to this? I know a lot of my New Yorkers, I know a lot of us are based out of different places, but I know most of my New Yorkers probably at some point went to this. It was a huge exhibition. Uh, the picture that you see in front of you uh, right now is from the ecclesiastical collection for John Galliano for Dior. Uh, and then here we have the celestial hierarchy, which is also um, a Dior piece by John Galliano. And I don't pretend to be an archivist or a curator, although I have a huge affinity for these exhibits. And it's one of my favorite things about living in New York City and traveling is going to museums and seeing these histories sort of laid out. But I want to uh, start this off by listening to someone who I think is 
an absolute uh, wealth of knowledge on the subject matter. So let's take a listen very quickly just to sort of get ourselves into the mentality of what this looks like and what this means. This is Andrew Bolton, who's the head curator of the Met Costume Institute. All right. So here we go. Heavenly Bodies, fashion and the Catholic imagination. It's about the influence of Catholic imagery on designers. Helena, then you have to switch your screen so we can see it. Oh, interesting. In two sites, the Met Fifth Avenue. Weird. This is new. I didn't have to, used to have to do that. All right. Mm. All right. We're going to stop that. We're going to, ah, I see. All right. Now you got it. Here we go. Take two. Heavenly Bodies, fashion and the Catholic imagination. It's about the influence of Catholic imagery on designers. It's the largest show that the Costume Institute has staged. It's in two sites, the Met Fifth Avenue and the Met Cloisters. The garments that we've chosen specifically relate to religious objects within the Met's collection. So in a way, it's a series of interventions, forging dialogues between fashion and the display of religious arts within a museum context. We have over 50 masterworks from the Vatican collection. Many haven't been seen outside of the Vatican before. The Byzantine galleries focus on designers who've been inspired by the interiors of Byzantine churches. One example is Giovanni Versace's Lost Collection, which was inspired by the micro mosaics at Ravenna Cathedral. And the medieval sculpture hall focuses on the holy ordering of the Catholic Church. And one of the highlights is by John Galliano for Christian Dior, a sort of figment of John's imagination of a pope. In the Met Cloisters, the exhibition is focusing on designers who've been inspired by monastic orders, but also the seven sacraments of the Catholic faith. With this catalog, we work with the artist Katrina Jen. Katrina scans garments, sometimes up to a hundred scans, and collages them back together. And that process captures the materiality of the garments in a greater detail than perhaps a camera. It almost gives a sort of saintly aura. Fundamentally, designers who either were raised or educated Catholic have a metaphorical inclination that defines their creative impulses. Designers certainly gravitate towards religious imagery for provocation. On the whole, I'd say that the majority of designers engage with it for nostalgia and for reasons of beauty. I hope that one of the takeaways from the exhibition is that Catholicism as a belief system has inspired some of the most extraordinary works of art. All right. So, I mean, I just find that breadth of knowledge just so incredible uh, to listen to. And you really see the insane amount of attention to detail that is put into this and the time and the effort. And, you know, to hear from the experts themselves to me is always um, the sort of uh, best way to educate. So let's bounce right back in. Switch this If up. I'm not mistaken, Jolene, that has the biggest uh, exhibition has at the Costume Institute, correct? Yes. Yeah. It was the largest undertaking from the Costume Institute. It included their two properties. So the Met on Fifth Avenue and the Met. Yeah. So it was huge. It also was the first time that the Vatican had taken out the, um, the papal uh, vetments to be uh, found somewhere else that wasn't the Vatican. So it was really, really big. And in fact, this entire uh, talk today is inspired uh, by the documentary the first monday in may so if you've never seen it i believe it's available either on youtube or it might still be up on netflix um it's a beautiful uh it, way to showcase this idea of fashion and museum exhibition sort of coming together it follows china through the looking glass and it uh, andrew bolton is very heavily featured in that let's jump on over to something completely different we have pink the history of punk pretty uh, uh, the history of pink, uh, pretty punk, powerful color, right? Um, so this was a chronological survey that looked at 300 years of pink in fashion. Um, they featured over 80 pieces from 18th century to present. 
uh, Christian Dior, Saint Laurent, Gucci, Moschino, Comme de Garçon. And I thought this exhibit was really great because first of all, it's at the FIT Museum. So uh, it ties together the idea of education and history and curatorial um, sort of importance. But pink is one of the most divisive colors and it provokes this feeling of like attraction and repulsion. And one of the questions that this exhibit raised so well was why is pink such an unserious color, right? On the one hand, it's associated with like femininity and romanticism. And on the other, there's this like terminal lack of serious, ser like unseriousness, right? Um, and the exhibit looked at this idea of like the pinkification of little girl culture uh, through the 20th century to today and how gender conformity, um, as in like pink for girls, blue for boys came into being and it was sort of this result of marketing campaigns to sell more children's clothing more than anything else. So it was a fascinating look at something that I don't think I would have thought otherwise, although millennial pink is everywhere right now, right? Like young people have sort of taken pink back as a color and it has gone from this sort of dainty thing to this really kind of um, cool evolution. So I thought this exhibit was really, uh, really interesting in its subject matter and the way it laid everything out. Moving on to the Chicago History Museum, the silver screen to the mainstream. Um, this was also a thematically inspired exhibit of costumes through the golden age of film and a lot of the garments on display included works from Chanel, Valentino, um, Adrian, Howard Greer. And when I think of um, film and fashion, instantly I think of like iconic things like the Givenchy dress that Audrey Hepburn, uh, Audrey Hepburn wore in Breakfast at Tiffany's, Jean-Paul Jean Gaultier who costumed The Fifth Element, right? When I think of like Leonardo DiCaprio and The Great Gatsby or Romeo and Juliet, which were both directed by Baz Luhrmann in partnership, uh, Uchia Prada did all the costumes for that, right? So fashion and film have this very intricate intertwined history. And then I always say, whenever we go to costume exhibits on tours, you know, what would your favorite films look like without their costumes, right? Imagine the Star Wars universe without those costumes, right? It's almost impossible to do. And costuming adds this level of unspoken storytelling within a film, which to me is so effective. I come from a theater background, so I don't feel like I'm in a, in a play until I put that costume on, right? So it's pretty incredible to see it all sort of laid out and displayed. Did anybody go to this? Is anyone from Chicago? I really wanted to see it. All right, moving along, we take a look at uh, the Brooklyn Museum, Killer Heels, the Art of the High-Heeled Shoe. Uh, this included 160 historical and contemporary heels, um, Manolo Blahnik, Chanel, Ferragamo, Christian Louboutin, Prada, Vivian Westwood, right? And this was cool because it was a thematic look at the way, different way designers have interpreted like a form of a high heel through the lens of history, right? Whether it's a fashion statement, a fetish object, an instrument of power, an outlet of artistic expression, right? Um, for, for both the designer and the wearer, it was fantastic. And it looked at the sort of commonality of architecture in a high heel design, right? When you think of architecture, you think of support, structure, and height. And that's exactly what a good high heel should encompass. And then they looked at uh, things. So, so in this previous gallery, oh, this next gallery, so we have a sort of cool layout of an exploration from 2000 years. So the Eastern influences of Japanese wood soles, along with contemporary stiletto heels, which again, sort of incorporate that like fetishy subculture. And there were also these six beautiful films that ran through the exhibit um, in which heels were featured as their sort of conceptual or thematic starting point, right? Uh, Raul, I believe you went to this, right? I missed this one, which was a bummer. Yeah, I went, I went. It was in the Brooklyn Museum, it was big. Uh, it was funny. They were actually, uh, they have um, some fashion films also, like uh, right, Stephen Klein. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Stephen Klein has an amazing fashion film on shoes, um, which is basically kind of, it was kind of like, uh, like interesting. It was, it's a pair of heels as a woman in heels, kind of like uh, destroying like a car, like kind of like a scratching it with the heel and, and right. the real sound of it. Yeah, it was, it was interesting. 
Cool. So then we move along to the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, and this exhibition was called uh, Gender Bending Fashion. And this basically looked at a century of hook tour and ready to wear and sort of challenged the rigid definition of gender and dressing. And this is super topical to what's going on right now, right? If you think of brands like the Fluid Project who are thriving in with their representation of of sort of a non-binary people, right? This exhibit featured 60 designs, Jean-Paul Gaultier, Christian Siriano, Virgil Abloh, Ray Kuakaba from Comme de Garçon, among many others. And it spoke to the view sort of more broadly to societal shifts in the past century, right? Including like the changing of gender roles, um, increasing visibility for the LGBT LGBTQ community and the rise of social media as this kind of powerful tool for self-expression. And honestly, defining identity on a spectrum rather than along like binary lines, that's like a cultural paradigm shift, right? And it goes hand in hand with like new modes of self-representation. And I thought that in researching this exhibit, it did a really cool job of sort of pushing that narrative and that expression, whether it was through sexuality or race or pop culture or activism or social justice, right? So this was a very well curated and fun exhibit. This next slide, this is a great uh, piece sort of questioning and challenging the idea of the feminine and the masculine. So moving on. So now we jump ahead to some of our solo shows or uh, curatorial exhibits that focused on a single designer. So this was at the National Art Center in Tokyo and the exhibit was called The Work of Issa Miyake. Um, this is a career retrospective for Issa Miyake. Uh, he is still alive. Uh, so this showed 45 years of his career to the present. Um, and if you're not familiar with Issa Miyake, if you've ever been to any exhibit that talks about um, technical proficiency, you will always see an Issa Miyake piece represented. Um, there was a lot of his stuff featured in Manus versus Machina at the Met a couple of years ago. Um, and he's best known for his origami collections, right? And the famous garment pleating, which involves pleating of clothing rather than textiles, which basically constructs garments. He makes garments at two to three size, two to three times the intended size, and then precisely folds irons and places them between paper into a heating press. So it's this mixing of ancient technique and cutting edge technology, right? This is the idea of that piece of cloth that he likes to work with. Um, what else can I say about Issa Miyake? Oh, uh, these mannequins. Oh, by the way, I some of my favorite um, photos of this exhibit uh, included these gorgeous mannequins. They were designed by uh, a sculptor named uh, Takuchin Yokushaka, uh, um, and they're made out of this acrylic. And I feel like with the idea of Issa Miyake's kind of technologically smart work, this kind of acrylic mannequin makes it really cool and engaging and fun. They also had these beautiful daily demonstrations where you could see the garment pleating. And they even had the classic like piece of cloth that a guest could come in and sort of drape and figure out how to do the classic sort of Isamiyaki style. A lot of these exhibits are very like low light um, for the preservation of the garments, right? And there's no flash photography, of course, ever in any of these exhibits. But this one was cool because it was so interactive and it really gave people a hands-on kind of moment. Moving on to Canada at the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, the Mugliere uh, exhibit. And this is the first retrospective that we've ever had of Mugliere's entire body of work. Um, he's also still alive, so it's um, from uh, 1977 to the present, and it examines his vision. This this exhibit was called Metamorphosis, Superheroines, and Cyborgs, right? So um, he's known for his use of like really unusual materials, right? Glass, chrome parts, latex, metal, LED lights. Um, anything that's sort of out of the ordinary or unorthodox. And he always creates these really sleek, like creatures, right? They're these elegant, hypersexual kind of powerful women. And this exhibit showed 150 garments. Um, and it also featured a lot of unpublished documents and sketches from the designer's archives, which is always fun to take a look and see into the mind of how they created this. Um, and it also featured a lot of photography uh, from Dave LaChapelle, um, Merton, Market, Merton Marcus, Carl Lagerfeld, Stephen Meisel, right? Um, and because he's so ostentatious, I feel like this idea of the fembot couture 
that's like his appeal, right? And a lot of his, um, his pieces are often worn by celebrities because they're so big and bold. So he costumed David, well not costumed, but dressed David Bowie. He's dressed Lady Gaga, Beyonce. And if you saw Cardi B last year at the Grammy Awards, that famous like sort of pearl dress that lo almost looked like the opening of a clam, right? That was a really beautiful vintage Mugler piece. Jumping ahead to the National Museum of Women in the Arts, uh, this is Rodarte. So this was the first solo exhibition for um, sisters Kate and Laura Malavi, who are the founders of Rodarte. Rodarte is actually their mother's maiden name. So this was more of a um, mid-career survey, and they wanted to really emphasize the idea of live theater. And I think they did it really smartly. Front and center is their ballerina tutus that they designed for Natalie Portman in the movie Black Swan. Moving on, this one we could talk about for forever. Um, the Dallas Museum of Art uh, built this really beautiful exhibit called, or hosted, I should say, uh, this beautiful exhibit called Dior from Paris to the World um, in Dallas, Texas. And Christian Dior himself was an art gallerist for 10 years before he even launched into design. So it's really embedded into the DNA of Dior to archive and curate their work. And Dior is a brand that is so global. Any given month, any given year, there are like five, six Dior exhibits around the world. Like before we went into quarantine, there was the VNA Designer of Dreams, the Miss Dior Love and Roses exhibit, Dior in Denver, Lady Dior, and From Paris to the World, right? And From Paris to the World surveys 70 years of the House of Dior's legacy and their influence. Um, and Dior, to me, there's two sides. There's this one, which is like quintessential Dior, right? Which set this beautiful post-World War II modern femininity standard. Um, and then there's this gallery, which just exhibits their kind of global influence, right? So it looks like it could be two separate exhibits, right? But it's just how vast their collection is, right? There were 200 couture dresses, accessories, photographs, sketches, videos, all tracing the history of the House of Dior. And each gallery, which I thought was cool, profiled uh, each artistic director from Christian Dior himself to the eras of Yves Saint Laurent, Mark Bowen, John Galliano, Raph Simmons. And for the first time, this particular exhibit highlighted Maria Grazia Curie, who is the first woman to be appointed as creative director of Dior. Nicole, I know you wanted to like desperately see this one as a Dior fan. Uh, moving along to the Wallace Collection, An Inquiring Mind by uh, Manolo Blahnik. So this was co-curated by the Wallace Collection director, Xavier Bray and Mr. Blahnik himself. Uh, Manolo Blahnik, who personally selected all the shoes from his private archive, it spans 50 years and each gallery explored a separate theme, right? So one gallery had theater and spectacle, one gallery was native Spain, and the one that we are looking at is the 18th century Rococo style. And this gallery's sort of key elements are um, aristocratic elegance through the 18th century of France and Russia. Um, the inspiration was the famous Louis the 16th heel, which was also featured at the Killer Heels exhibit. And in the background, you can sort of see um, the shoes that he designed for Sofia Coppola's film Marie Antoinette. Moving on to the Museum of Art and Design. This is Anna Sui's exhibit. I kind of want to, again, like sometimes I, I wish we removed the designer to see if you guys could uh, figure out who it is based on the exhibition itself. Uh, but this is, um, Anna Sui is always called fashion's favorite daughter because of her sort of reinvention and accessibility of like this idea of boutique granola aesthetic, right? Um, this was from The Mad in New York City and it featured a hundred of her looks focusing on her unique use of textiles and her pop culture references, right? I always love Anna Sui's collections because it's like filtered through this lens of grunge, hippie, mod, surfer, which is a great sort of celebration of like feminine counterculture, right? Take it like take into example what we just looked at at Dior, which was so classically feminine. Um, and then this is sort of that idea of counterculture. I thought it was really fun. And the MAD is known for their textile exhibits and she works really beautifully with textiles. So it was a good marriage of the minds. Moving on to the Dominican Republic. This uh, was the exhibit, um, this was sort of a Valentine from 
the Oscar de la Renta Foundation to the city of Santiago in the Dominican Republic. And it's a chronological survey which features 50 of his original garments before he passed away. And what was amazing about this is there is a 30 minute documentary that before you even make your way through the galleries, you don't obviously have to watch the entire thing, but it is a 30 minute documentary uh, that chronicles and interviews Anna Wintour, Hillary Clinton, Julio Iglesias, and it highlights his life, his philanthropical contributions, his legacy. Um, so it was really sort of classic and beautiful. Very sort of classically Oscar de la Renta, right? All those beautiful um, gowns, which I think the new creative directors have carried over really beautifully. Moving on over to, okay, I'm very, very biased, but I've lived in New York for uh, 14 years this year. And of the 14 years I've been here, this is by far my favorite exhibit that I've ever been to, whether it was fashion or not. Um, this was a co, sort of a co-pro, a co-production between the Met in New York City and the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Um, and it is universally regarded, whether you're in fashion or not, as one of the best exhibitions for a museum of the 21st century. And I think Alexander McQueen is easily recognized as a luminary in the fashion industry, right? It's always really amazing uh, to see his work. And Alexander McQueen was constantly sort of promoting the freedom of thought and expression and championed this like authority of imagination, right? He was also, you know, if you know anything about him, a very tortured soul, you know, when he died, you know, he committed suicide very tragically. And he always referred to himself as the Edgar Allan Poe of fashion. So he was really dark and his collections always reflect this paradoxical relationship between like polarizing opposites, right? Whether it was light and death, life and death, light and darkness, man and machine, predator and prey, and even the title of this exhibition, right? Savage Beauty, that's the sort of juxtaposition of ideas, right? This gallery right here was one of my favorites. I really could have just done a full hour on this exhibit alone. Uh, yeah. But this was the idea of romantic nationalism, right? And McQueen was always an incredible storyteller. As a storyteller myself, I have such a respect for people who have narrative-based collections. I find them so engaging. And on the left, you can sort of see um, his great pride in his paternal Scottish heritage shown through that classic tartan plaid. And on the right is his love of British history and pageantry, right? So he was born and raised in London. His father was Scottish. And this is like a showcasing of his dual nature, right? It's a face off between the Scots and the Brits, which have this very muddy history uh, anyway. In the second um, gallery, yes. Stacy is saying, uh, I couldn't get into the McQueen exhibit in New York City. Uh, try, but it was sold out. I remember I went there three times and I remember the lines every time. Every time. Um, I saw it twice as well. And I but waited, it was worth it. I waited three hours each time, but I had to go back and see it. It was incredible. Yeah. Um, I was telling I yeah. was telling Nicole the other day that um, I, I think the McQueen was my first exhibition that when I moved to New York. So ever since I haven't missed anyone, anything. So I never, I don't think I've seen a level of production that that went into that exhibition no nothing nothing there was there was air there were screens it was fire um water anything that you possibly can imagine was involved in that exhibition it was incredible yeah we're actually going to take a look at a video of it because it's so just like massive and like magnanimous right um this right here was mcqueen's final inspiration or final collection it's called uh plato's atlantis and it was inspired by charles darwin's on the origin of species and what was uh, of course, very McQueen is that it's centered not around the evolution of human man of humankind, but the de-evolution, right? It was his last fully realized collection before his death. And it created this complex, like digital engineered prints inspired by sea creatures. And it also introduced uh, the famous armadillo boot, right? The McQueen armadillo boot. And again, this was about duality, right? So nature versus technology. Again, those sort of opposing forces. We're going to take a look at the video from the exhibit. This is from the VNA, not from the Met because I think the VNA just had a, a better sort of visual guide uh, just so you could see how big and how to Raul's point beautifully thought out this entire exhibit was so let me just go ahead and switch this up so we can share that hold on let's pop that open first since I'm what's strange is now I have to switch between the two but totally fine here we go. 
All right, let's take a look at Savage Beauty for all those that couldn't go. And then you can see the stats at the bottom of just how huge this undertaking was for everyone who put it together, right? All the statistics are there. Um, I love this shoe. It's a beautiful, beautiful, the bone heel example of primitivism, which was a house code for McQueen. And this is the work of um, jeweler and longtime collaborator, Sean Lean. Sean Lean worked with McQueen. They were best friends. That's him right there on the left. He worked on all of his collections and built all of this sort of military gear for him. These are the, uh, the curators and the staff very gently putting everything together. This is the romantic Gothic gallery inspired by Victorian Gothic. The McQueen skulls, of course, throwbacks to the sort of runway presentations. And to your point, who was <laughs> whoever was saying the lines were so long I couldn't get in, right? And that final shot that you see is um, his is a self or a portrait of Alexander of Lee McQueen, um, to, taken two months before he died by his brother, who's actually a photographer. So it's a really sort of stoic and um, dark way to to sort of end the exhibit for sort of you know fashion's most tortured being. All right, let me jump back on to our screen shares. So like I Sally, said- Sally, Jolene, uh, huh? just say, Sally uh, yeah. in this live just say, um, uh, I, uh, the best exhibition I've ever seen, I saw it in London and I was there for four hours. Yeah, because it also yeah. fell into London. That's amazing. I'm so glad you got to see it at the VNA. I, I you know, it's one of those that yeah, I think I spent like two hours in it as well, partly because it was so crowded, but also because there was so much detail everywhere you looked, right? Like every room had a different theme and a different story. And it was just, uh, you know, a masterclass, right? All right, so moving on, now we've got, um, I call them art house museums. It's not like the technical term for them, but, um, this is where brands get to tell their story, right? This is where they get to curate and sort of be the own, their own um, bosses and have their own spaces. And so I find it always really interesting to sort of walk into these spaces that are unique to the house or unique to the brand. So let's start with one that I know some of the folks here have been to, which is the Musée Yves Saint Laurent in Paris, right? Um, this is actually located in the hotel that was the former studio of Mr. Uh, Laurent himself. And it's at the Foundation Yves Saint Laurent and it offers a focus on his work. So there's over 30 permanent uh, fixtures on display, garments, accessories. There's also rooms filled with prototypes that were used during the runway shows or, um, you know, built for the runway shows and the actual studio in which um, thousands of garments actually came to life. So this is um, some archival images on the left, some of the jewels that were used in the runway show. And then on this side, this is uh, say Yves Saint Laurent's actual office. And the curators of the museum kept it intact, right? So his actual desk still has old coffee cup stains on it and pencils that are not sharpened, right? It's kind of like walking into this experience and stepping into a time capsule and sort of getting into the mind of the man as he built these really beautiful collections. Has anyone been to this? To the Yves Saint Laurent house? No, maybe. All right. <laughs> Yeah, you have. My favorite 
museum I've probably ever went to. Yeah, right? There's just something about stepping in the stepping in the sort of footsteps of the people who actually built the legacy, that there's something really special about that. I mean, that's why we love museums, right? To take a look at past people and sort of interpret what that could mean for the future. It's amazing. So then we jump to the Museo Gucci, which is part of the Gucci compound um, in Florence, right? Uh, we talked about the Gucci restaurant. Um, this is a three-story space, which includes a movie theater. They have a cinema and it's arranged thematically and it's divided into different displays of Gucci craftsmanship, right? So travel, sport, flora, evening, and this idea of logomania, which has become really popular with Gucci. And the museum, I think, does a really cool job of narrating the house's vision and it chronicles the evolution of Gucci, right? Right. Um, on that back wall, you can see this is the Flora World Gallery. On the back wall, you see the etymology of the Flora scarf print. And it was originally commissioned in 1966 by Rodolfo Gucci for the Princess of Monaco, Grace Kelly. So not only is this like you can see the collections in the front, uh, this particular room, because it was Flora World, it was inspired by nature. So all of the collections that you see, obviously, a lot of animal prints, a lot of animal textiles, right? Furs, exotics skins like crocodile, but tying into the idea of nature. And in this gallery, um, we see the uh, flora being sort of transported and turned into the wallpaper that Gucci is famous for and the evolution of the, uh, the double G, right? The Guccio Gucci monogram belt. And then they have really beautiful, these sort of little curio cabinets throughout the exhibit. And they have, um, really beautiful magazine covers or campaigns that they've hosted that are historical or relevant uh, to the brand. And, you know, we, when Coach was on a couple weeks back, you know, they talked about how important their archival process is and how it informs the collections that are coming down the runway. So it's really kind of neat. Moving on to something very different, but something that I absolutely love. I know Raul has been here. Um, the Fondazione Prada, right? The foundation Prada. It was founded by Muccia Prada and her husband, Patrizio Bertelli. Um, and it's an institution uh, designed by an artist named, or an architect rather, named um, Rem Koolhaas. And it's dedicated entirely to contemporary art. So this is a space not to showcase Prada's collections, but its cultural spotlight is on architecture, cinema, photography, philosophy, the things that inspire Prada as a house, right? Which I think is a really cool way to flip the script on our presentation today, right? Instead of just showing you clothes, they're showcasing what inspires them, right? So um, they treat it as this sort of laboratory of ideas and they really view it as an opportunity for Prada to give back to Milan and its people. This is an example. I don't know if Nicole and Raul, you went into this room, um, but this is a really cool exhibit uh, by an artist named Carlston Hewler. It's called Upside Down Mushrooms. And they have um, rotating artists that come in and out of the space. And then they have permanent artists that are always there like Jeff Koons, Def Flavin, Dan Flavin, Louise Bourgeois, right? Filmmaker Steve McQueen built a film for their cinema. So it's a really cool, unique space for inspiration. Yeah, it's very cool. My favorite part is actually the bathrooms, actually. You know, it's funny, uh, a good bathroom design is, is kind of- It just of looked like Prada. You went to the bathroom and I was like, am I in a Prada store? It looks just like Prada. Yeah, exactly. And the artists that they chose to focus on and choose to highlight often have this sort of Prada codes to them, right? Yes, it's yes, very yes. It's very cinematic. Like if you walk through all the art exhibits, you're like, oh, this is not Prada clothes, but it looked like it could be a Prada campaign. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. So then we move to the Museo Salvatore Ferragamo uh, in Florence. Uh, and this exhibition was called Across Art and Fashion, which is basically the theme of our uh, chat today. And this is the idea that art is has always been this incubator of inspiration for designers, right? And this was a collaboration between um, the Ferragamo Museum and lots of different museums throughout Italy. Um, and we always see artists derivative in tons of brands, right? If I think of like Dior and Andy Warhol, Louis Vuitton and Monet, Coach and Keith Haring, right? These marriages are always happening. Um, in this particular gallery, this is uh, Rosa Genoni's corp cape, uh, court cape um, made of silk velvet and embroidery. It was created in 1906 and it was inspired 
uh, by watercolors by Italian Renaissance painter uh, Pisanello. And I'm going to give you an art history moment. What artist is this? Somebody has to know this. I'll give you the designer is Yves Saint Laurent, right? This was his very famous shift dress that came down the runway and sort of everyone went wild for it. Um, and this is a, an artist that is probably one of the most borrowed artists. We've seen Chanel, Moschino, Hermes, even Nike um, took this idea of color blocking. This is Piet Mondrian's uh, comic yeah. too, right? Pilar, Pilar, Deborah, and Cindy Swapson got it right. They Perfect. both, they all yes, say Mondrian. Of course, Mondrian. Mondrian and the idea of color blocking, when we talk about color, uh, primary colors in three weeks from now, we'll touch on him, but he's always a big inspiration for lots and lots of designers, right? Like I said, Chanel, Moschino, Nike, right? Um, and Yves Saint Laurent just sort of made this moment very, uh, very famous. And then we move on to something sort of different, but not, right? This is a variation on a theme. I really wanted to include this because the Harley Davidson Museum, which is in Milwaukee, is not necessarily fashion, but to me, it's always fascinating to see how a brand celebrates a captive audience or a cult following, right? So think about Harley Davidson, not through the lens of fashion, but through the lens of a product or a brand, right? And they are the largest producers of bikes in the world. And what's interesting is that this museum attracted last year, half a million visitors, right? And that's pretty much on par with them. So half a million people go to Milwaukee, uh, Milwaukee Wisconsin, just to see this exhibition. And they're just in rich as history as any fashion brand. They've been around since 1903, and they have this very long and proud mechanical industrial heritage. And the museum is this chronological survey of that heritage, right? So you can see in this photo, this was one of their first designs on the back wall. You can see the four founders of Harley Davidson. Um, and since 1915, the company those founders have put one bike from the production line to be preserved. So they have this really amazing extensive archive. And it is worth noting that 5% of Harley Davidson's $6 billion annual revenue is through clothes, right? When you think of Harley Davidson's, I think of biker gangs. And when I think of that, I think of leather jackets, right? So they're making a lot of money um, in the fashion industry through their brand name. Then we have the um, Armani Silos. So they decided, Armani um, decided to call this the Silos because it was, or a silo, I should say, um, because the space before uh, Armani moved in there was an actual storage facility for food. So he loved the idea of food and sustenance sustaining you just the way that fashion does. And this is an overview of Giorgio Armani's career, right? And what's amazing, it's very sort of seemingly small, but it houses over 600 looks, 200 accessories over spanning 40 years. And it's divided up thematically. So there is uh, the theme of androgyny, exoticism, and ethnicities. And that's what's pictured here. That's this gallery. Um, in this gallery, we see the sort of strong influence of these non-Western cultures, Persia, Africa, Japan, Syria, China. Um, and then the third exhibit was stars, right? Focusing on red carpet glamour. Armani is on every Oscar best dress list usually, and then digital archives, which is really fascinating because you could actually go to their lab and you can sit down and look through all of their online catalogs, right? Because a museum is an analog experience, right? You're walking through at your own pace, you're taking a look at the garments, you're taking it all in, um, but they can't necessarily house everything, even though 600 pieces are a lot. So the online catalogs allow you to sort of go and look at it. And apparently a lot of students like to go to like research. So it's a really, um, fascinating place and it's designed to be very minimalistic and very very Armani and then we end with this is my favorite story of all of the aside from I love the McQueen because of its artistry but I wanted to include this one it's from the gallery uh, the Alaya gallery in Paris um, because it's the sort of tale of two designers, right? So just some history context. In 1968, when um, Cristobal ben Balenciaga closed his studio, um, Azadeen Alaya, who was a huge fan, acquired those archives. And 
at the time, the archives were given to him to potentially change and revamp and breathe new life into the brand. But he had so much respect for Balenciaga's tailoring and sort of technical virtuosity that he used the garments instead as this muse for his own collection. So he preserved them and held on to them, and they became this inspiration for him. And this exhibit particularly is really fascinating because it's the brainchild of fashion historian um, Olivier Sal uh, Saliard, uh, Carla Suzani, who was the editor in chief of Vogue Italy at the time, and Hubert de Givenchy, right? So Givenchy himself, all of these people knew Alaya and they knew how much he personally loved Balenciaga. And when he passed away, they really wanted to do something to commemorate this reverence that Alaya had for Balenciaga. So they built this exhibit which is like a labor of love, right? This idea and this honorarium to two brilliant men that had a lot in common. They both loved to use black. They were both very sculptural in the way they built their clothing. They were both very private and they didn't believe in traditional fashion weeks. They didn't give interviews, right? And this, uh, exhibit was sort of conceived. I love how it's like this pristine white labyrinth. There were 80 different pieces that were chosen. And here we get to see pieces from both designers and they mirror one another, right? They never get too physically close to one another. And that's basically a reflection of the fact that these two men never actually met in person. So their paths never crossed, even though Alaya was so influenced by um, Balenciaga. So it's kind of like this like very epic, posthumous designer tennis match, right? You see each piece and you see the commonality. Um, it's really cool. And this is currently going on, obviously, uh, not given the circumstances, but it is um, still in the gallery right now. And it is scheduled to travel to the Balenciaga Foundation uh, in about four months, if, you know, fingers crossed. I should also mention that a lot of these galleries, um, the Prada Foundation, the Gucci Museum, the Met, the v &A, um, this gallery, are all on view virtually. So if you wanna take a look, you can go to all of their websites and you can actually see these exhibitions and you can view them on your own terms um, virtually. And that is the end. So um, questions, comments, let me know what you thought. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and eliminate that screen share so I can see your faces. And obviously, this is something that we could have, um, again, gone through for another three hours. There are so many of these exhibits. This was just a sort of highlight reel of some of my personal favorites and some of um, the biggest uh, of, uh, of, you know, the past 20 plus years. But any thoughts? Any favorites? Pilar. Thank you so much. Very interesting. Amazing. Yes. It's always our pleasure. And uh, yes, exactly. We can literally fill chapter two with this subject matter. And we're actually going to get into brand activations as museums in a couple of weeks. So we're going to see the sort of flip side of what, um, you know, these not so popular or rather not so permanent um, museums look like when they bounce around in different cities. And you never thought of an exhibit on just high heels. Yeah, that's interesting, right? This idea that, you know, this very ubiquitous shoe that sort of represents femininity um, was actually worn by men before it was worn by woman, women and was worn by, you know, royals. And I love, I am a scholar always. I love learning. It's why I love these exhibits. Um, and, you know, just when you think that, like, is that subject matter that would make sense? You go in and you learn about the history of pink, right? Or you learn about the history of, um, of high heels or a particular designer. Can we view the recording? I missed the first 15 minutes. Yeah, it will be, I believe, up on our site. And that's a great point. Thank you for bringing that up, Nina. Um, all of the material that we shared with you today is available on windowswear.com. I believe on our trends page, if, uh, if I'm not incorrect. It will, it will be in the same uh, link of the event. There you uh, go. Yeah, so it's every, every Windows Wear Live that we have uh, gone through, you guys can find it over there. There you go. So you can catch up and you can uh, watch them or listen to them like their podcasts as you're, you know, walking around your apartment or your house. Um, but yes, we, uh, we absolutely, you know, do our due diligence to archive and make sure that we are, uh, you know, 
maintaining all this information for you guys. So you can check that out on windowsware.com. And just some announcements coming up on Thursday. We have um, Josiah Slimwell from LVMH Cosmetics and Beauty. He's going to be talking about um, a new retail concept design. So if you are interested in that, it's going to be fantastic. Um, Josiah is a wealth of knowledge and, um, you know, he's representing LVMH, which is fantastic. So tune in Thursday at 3 p.m. for that. And then next Tuesday, we'll be back here with me and we're going to take a look at the business of beauty. So again, this Thursday with Josiah Slamwell of LVMH and next Tuesday on, I believe, the business of beauty. Any other questions? We're here if you want to talk to us, if you want to chat, if you want me to take a look and go back and take a look at some other, some other slides. Thank you. Thank you, Pilar. Thank you, Jolene. Someone named Deborah asked um, yes. if the Dior exhibit at v &A had higher attendance than the McQueen. She heard that the Dior broke all records. Correct. Yeah. So cumulatively, McQueen between the Met and the VNA is like the highest grossing exhibit of all time. But for the VNA specifically, um, it is the Dior exhibit. Yeah, Dior Designer of Dreams just broke that record. And that McQueen exhibit was in what, 2013? So, you know, it took all the way to 2020 to break uh, McQueen's record, but that is correct information. Yeah, the, the new Dior Designer of Dreams exhibit is now the most uh, viewed, which is amazing when you think of these museums and these cultural institutions, right? People go to the Louvre to see the Mona Lisa, right? Or they go to the MoMA to see Vincent van Gogh's Starry Night, and yet um, what's breaking these sort of box office records is these fashion exhibits, right? They really do bring in uh, people in droves. Thank you, Carolyn. Yes, thank you, Pilar from Madrid. Buenas, buenas noches. <laughs> Got quite the time difference over there. All right, so uh, that does it for us. Um, again, so this Thursday, LVMH Josiah, thank you so much for joining us. Next Tuesday, we're gonna take a look at the business of beauty. Everybody stay safe, um, stay well, and we will see you on Thursday. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Bye.